All right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Karen, and I'm with uh, the Canadian Women's Foundation. I'm a program manager here, and I'd like to welcome you all uh, to the webinar uh, on the Sustainable Livelihoods Framework um, that is related to our economic development work. We're very pleased to have so many of you online with us today from right across the country. Looks like we have about 40 people on the line with us, maybe 41 or 42. Uh, so we're very happy to have so many people interested in, uh, in this framework and how it relates to our call for proposals um, for our multi-year economic development funding. Um, so Many of you are probably joining because you heard about this webinar, because of the funding um, that we have on offer. And um, just to sort of set it out for you, we use the Sustainable Livelihoods Framework as a way to talk about our economic development work. And so we wanted to take this opportunity to sort of set that out for you and help you understand what the framework is all about and how it, uh, and to start you thinking on how it applies to your work as you prepare your uh, applications for, for funding. Um, so online with us today we have our amazing presenter, Chanel Grunaway. She has been directing our economic development programming at the foundation for many years now. And I'm sure many of you know her uh, from her uh, long time of working in this field. And we also have Beth Malcolm online with us, who's another director here at the foundation. And uh, between Beth and myself, we'll be um, kind of monitoring the questions that you have as they come in. And, uh, and at the end of Chanel's presentation, she'll open up the floor and, uh, and Beth and I will pose your questions uh, to her. You can put your questions in uh, by typing in the question box that you see on the right-hand panel of your GoToWebinar application screen. Um, and so as you go, if there are questions, please don't hesitate to, uh, to type them into that box and we'll keep an eye on them and uh, make sure that Chanel gets to them uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, and also note that if, if you have specific question, uh, questions about your project or your organization's eligibility to apply for an economic development grant, um, that those kinds of questions is, are something that I can work with you on directly. Um, so my contact information will be at the end of the webinar and you can feel free to send me an email or um, we can set up a time to talk by phone. Um, but if you have questions related specifically to the Sustainable Livelihoods Framework and Chanel's presentation, then by all means means please put them in the question box and we will get to them. Um, also would like to let you know that this session is being recorded and we will share the recording uh, by email. We're getting it translated as well and so we'll have a French version and an English version to share and the same is, is for the webinar that we did last week on the application process. So you'll be receiving an email uh, later this week that has links to the recordings of both of those sessions in English and in French as well as um, the slide uh, PDFs. So you'll be able to have um, access to those as well. So with that, I think I will turn things over to Chanel uh, to start us on this presentation about the Sustainable Livelihoods Framework. Chanel? Thanks so much, Karen, and welcome to everyone who is online with us today. Uh, again, I, as Karen did, I'm also um, thanking you for your interest in uh, the Canadian Women's Foundation's economic development grants and our call for proposals, as well as the Sustainable Livelihoods Framework. Um, this is a bit full circle for me, as I remember when I first started at the Foundation, uh, learning about this model, and actually right after learning about it, um, going um, coast to coast to coast to um, do some training on the model as well as on uh, logic models at the time. So it's nice to be here again many years later um, still um, using this model and um, uh, reframing it in terms of our current economic development uh, strategic plan. So today's agenda includes a high-level overview of the Sustainable Livelihoods Model. Uh, we've actually done full workshops on this, and you know this is a one-hour webinar, so you'll have to um, bear with us and just understand this is at a high level, um, and I will be giving you um, additional resources and places where you can go to delve deeper into the model. So we'll start off with a bit of a history and uh, definitions that we use here at the Foundation. Uh, we'll also look at the framework in itself, and I'll do my best to um, deconstruct it for you. 
uh, we're also going to be looking at the stages of transformation uh, within the sustainable livelihoods model. And that's where we really get into how the model is used to describe a women's transition out of poverty. And lastly, we're going to look at the impact um, of the model uh, and situate the model in terms of our current call for proposals. Uh, and as Karen mentioned, uh, please feel free to um, note questions in the questions box or save them until the end. So in terms of the history of the foundation's use of the sustainable livelihoods model, uh, we actually borrowed and uh, modified the approach from sustainable livelihoods guidance sheets that were developed by the British Department for International Development and the Institute for Development Studies at the University of Sussex, England. And this framework was first developed to support poverty alleviation in developing countries. I must also credit uh, the work done by Economos, uh, so that was Janet Murray and Mary Ferguson, who we worked with uh, in the late 1990s um, uh, through our evaluation work at that time to help us, uh, again, apply and adapt the model to a Canadian context. So the foundation has used this model in uh, our economic development work for over 15 years. And uh, during that time, it was uh, continuously adapted to include a more women's focused uh, lens and a holistic approach to program delivery that we were funding, again, stemming back from the um, mid 1990s. Economos has since um, applied this framework to other um, areas of program evaluation. And it's interesting, many of the grantees that we worked with in those very early formative years have continued to use uh, the framework in their own poverty reduction work, in their own thinking about um, uh, poverty reduction for women. Um, the United Way of Greater Toronto also um, has used this model in terms of their harm reduction and research um, uh, strategies. Uh, so it's, uh, while I would say uh, we funded and supported a lot of the um, early stage work, really many organizations have gone on to make this their own, which I think is uh, fabulous and a testament to the model itself. So a few definitions. Um, the definition that we use for the term livelihood um, is outlined on the screen. Um, uh, a livelihood is sustainable when it can cope with and recover from stresses and shocks to maintain or enhance assets both now and in the future. So it really is about long-term uh, sustainability and that's our, our ultimate goal. We know that life, um, uh, life and transitions don't happen in a linear way. So um, you'll see later on when, you, when, I, when we get to the image of the model that there are um, cycles and circle back. So I think this definition um, allows for um, those uh, stresses and mentions the shocks that come into the system, but also the importance of being able to withstand those shocks. And the definition of uh, sustainability um, is uh, also on the screen. And the key components here um, is around resiliency, which I um, previously spoke about. It's also about economic efficiency. So again, the ability to build assets, um, even if you're starting with a small resource base. It's about social equality. Again, the having the opportunities um, and ensuring that the opportunities are equally distributed within the household, the community, and the economy. And um, there is the... Uh, added factor of the um, external or the environmental context. So um, uh, definitely uh, a woman's experience of poverty is not all in isolation, it's not all about her. There's also lots of external factors that impact uh, her experience. So we like this term because uh, it redirects the energy of programs towards poverty, uh, towards poverty reduction and not just um, uh, poverty allevi alleviation. So again, that speaks to the resiliency piece. It also emphasizes um, the different uh, uh, different 
ways and approaches of um, uh, of building assets. So in, in some cases, uh, success for a woman might be income patching, for example. Uh, we also like it because the approach is participatory and empowering. And as, as I work through the slides, you'll see how it's a very self-directed approach um, and an approach that starts where women are at. So again, a very positive asset-based approach. And this, si this slide uh, talks about the, uh, a little broader in terms of um, uh, the livelihood um, uh, section of it. And it's our understanding that a sustainable livelihood is broad and holistic, and it goes beyond the idea of economic independence or obtaining a, or obtaining jo a job. It also includes uh, participation in your household, your community, and society. It includes control over your social and economic decisions um, and control over your finances. So uh, our ultimate goal, of course, is um, economic and social sustainability for women. And again, when uh, we speak about the building of assets, uh, it, we take a very holistic approach which you'll see in a few slides again. In terms of the philosophy or values behind the sustainable livelihood uh, model, uh, I've listed four here that are key. Uh, the first one, even though it says women-centered, or sorry, people-centered, my mind is always women-centered. Um, I, I did put people-centered here just because this model can be used and is used in various contexts. For the Canadian Women's Foundation, of course, it is uh, about being women-centered. We start where the women are at. Um, as mentioned, it's a very positive asset-based approach where uh, we look at uh, building on the existing strengths of women. and. We have many p uh, wonderful examples where women are brought together in economic development programs and uh, they share experiences about uh, uh, so their challenges, but the more empowering piece is they uh, share and recognize the assets that they already bring to the table. And we know that for some mainstream organizations, that's not the way it's done. Sometimes intake forms really are more deficit oriented and it's talking about, well, what are your challenges? What don't you have? Um, what do you need? Again, um, if you use this model and the way uh, the tools that uh, are developed to support this model, it's very much the reverse. It's very much about um, looking at the assets you have. And sometimes, you know, uh, women don't recognize their assets uh, and, and if they, if they are in uh, or just coming out of particularly uh, challenging situations, it's hard for them to see their assets. So again, this model um, helps to reframe their, their, their own thinking of where they're at in terms of a continuum um, and, and their journey um, out of poverty. Uh, the model also is results oriented and strategic. Again, uh, the tools that uh, go along with the model help to build long term sustainability of livelihoods. So, again, it's about the ability to withstand or bounce back from shock shocks or setbacks that often occur in a woman's life. Um, we encourage uh, organizations to take a solution oriented approach to helping women. Uh, and again, through the asset mapping tools, uh, women are encouraged to do goal setting and action planning and, you know, have one-on-one -on -one check ins with their support groups and their support systems um, to keep them moving towards uh, the goals that they have set for themselves. So we're now entering into uh, uh, the part of the presentation where we're getting a little bit more into the framework itself. Uh, so in terms of if I were just to describe what the Sustainable Livelihoods Framework is, I would describe it as a framework for understanding and talking about uh, women's journey out of poverty or women's transition to uh, increased economic and social uh, independence. So it's a way of talking about your work and the supports you provide for uh, women in your programs. 
It's also an excellent tool to explore the four contextual dimensions of poverty. Um, so uh, the framework has categorized, uh, categorized and developed uh, an image that uh, outlines a, a woman's transition out of poverty. And so the four main pieces of this image, which you'll see on the next slide, are the, is the vulnerability context, which again, uh, what are the barriers that women face uh, uh, while um, uh, moving and, and moving out of poverty and building their assets? Um, there's uh, obviously a section on the five asset building blocks, which we'll review. Then there's the stages of livelihood development, which again is a categorization of the different uh, processes that a woman goes through while she's um, building her assets and moving towards sustainable livelihood. And then there's the overall policy context, which I spoke about earlier. Again, um, all of this works, work and um, a woman's life takes place within an environment, within a policy context, so that also has to be taken into consideration. So we're going to go into um, uh, a little bit more of a description of these uh, dimensions um, as it's uh, a big part of the framework. And here we are with uh, the image of the Sustainable Livelihoods Framework. So we're going to stay on this slide for a little bit. This is an early version of the slide that um, can be found in uh, our Women in Transition Out of Poverty report, which is on our website, as well as in our more recent um, 2010 Beyond Survival report. Uh, so there, this, uh, this particular uh, diagram and illustration has been changed and maybe many of you have seen it in, in later iterations. I chose this one for today just because it was simple and I think it um, does a good job of um, uh, highlighting the main aspects of the framework itself. I do encourage you to go on our website uh, and into our resource section of, uh, to find additional uh, information and all of the, the, the backup materials of, of many of the concepts that I'm going to be speaking about today. Um, as I mentioned, I can't go into detail or into, into in-depth detail on every piece, but we have all of this information and more uh, on our website. So if you do want some additional information, I encourage you to visit our website. So this illustration represents the range of external factors and forces that directly or indirectly shapes uh, a women's uh, environment. Uh, so if we look at the vulnerability context, which is uh, right at the top there, and, and, and if, even though this is uh, sort of a rectangular uh, image or a box, um, it could easily have been a circle where vulnerability is really the, the, a bigger piece um, around, uh, uh, around and highlighting the inner, inner portions. And likewise, the policy and institutional context would be the, the larger um, outer circles if, if it were uh, in a circular form. Um, and as mentioned, the vulnerability context really refers to uh, the barriers that women face and the challenges that women face uh, um, when they start programs um, at, uh, and when they're looking um, for help. When um, they, uh, these barriers and vulnerabilities can occur at two levels, um, uh, as I mentioned. So one are uh, in, at the individual level where um, for you know, for for many reasons, um, we know that uh, women um, uh, are in situations of poverty, are living in low income. You know, for all of those various reasons, that's what the vulnerability context refers to, as well as the bigger, broader policy and um, institutional. Uh, contextual pieces, um, which those pieces, again, women don't, um, at one level, women don't have as much say about, um, but at another level, I think once they start to build their assets, they can have a greater voice in changing and uh, trying to find solutions around the um, uh, policy and institutional context within her life. 
so the, the vulnerability context also includes uh, cycles that women go through, um, systems, in, systems around her, um, as well as what we call shocks or setbacks that may um, undermine her stability, um, her security, and her uh, ability to, to move forward in terms of her own personal goals. Um, so systems refers to um, biases and forms of discrimination that reduce women's opportunities and social uh, and economic pathways. So they can't, it's, it could include um, sexism, racism, and many of the other isms would uh, constitute sort of those systems barriers. Uh, we also have cycles, and these are patterns uh, that um, are connected to women's lives, and they can include uh, uh, family roles and relationships. Um, for example, if, um, if she has young children, taking care of young children. Um, likewise, elder care. So those cycles uh, that happen in a woman's life have a direct impact on her um, uh, relationship to the economy. Um, and then there are also um, economic trends that uh, impact a women's uh, vulnerability context, and those um, include broader social, economic, and political, for, uh, political forces. Uh, examples of those uh, could be uh, when there's a recession or when there's an increase in precarious employment in uh, her uh, community. Um, uh, that uh, again have a direct impact uh, on uh, her ability and her uh, access uh, to employment. Uh, and as I mentioned, vulnerability context is al also impacted by shocks and setbacks. So again, unexpected things that happen in one's life um, that um, uh, can happen to anyone and happen to all of us that again uh, require resiliency and a support system in order to um, weather and move through um, uh, those uh, those shocks and those um, setbacks. Uh, and uh, again, I mentioned the policy context that we all ha also have to uh, bear in mind, um, and these include uh, uh, larger. It, it could include larger external policy. Um, set by municipal or provincial or federal governments, uh, such as uh, social assistance policies, access to credit or microloans. Uh, it could also include uh, labor, uh, labor market uh, changes, um, access to apprenticeship opportunities, for example, or even access to um, employment programs in, in particular areas. So uh, those are the, the outer, um, in terms of the framework, the, the, um, uh, the environmental um, uh, impacts and, and forces that um, either can um, create barriers for women or, again, uh, have impact her movement towards a sustainable livelihood. If we move on the inside now, this is where the foundation and where your programming and your support for women um, uh, takes into effect. So the foundations funds programs that offer um, practical and supportive interventions, so th those are the economic development programs that you deliver uh, for women living with low incomes. Uh, and you provide uh, direct supports with women in order to build their assets and reduce their vulnerability. So that whole um, section under strategic interventions and practical um, interventions, that's really about the work that we fund through our um, grantee organizations. Um, the foundation um, and many of the organizations that we fund, we do recognize that you also work at um, uh, the policy level to make changes for women um, uh, as uh, in terms of the foundation's work. we. It, recognize the importance of not just funding organizations to do work that support women, but that it's important to have a voice on the policy level. And uh, we do that to the best of our ability using our resources. Um, uh, we sit at um, different tables in terms of uh, uh, bringing our voice and the lessons we've learned 
uh, to governments, to um, employers, um, and we also support, um, where possible, uh, our grantees to do that. And as I mentioned, uh, I strongly believe that women themselves, once they start to develop their assets, can also influence the policies themselves. And they do that by becoming more active citizens, um, voicing their own insights into municipal bylaws, social assistance regulations, uh, or other social issues um, that, that impact them uh, directly. So a livelihood becomes sustainable when um, uh, we can support women to minimize their vulnerability, again, being able to cope with and recover from those shocks and stresses, and when they're able to build economic uh, productivity. So again, putting their assets to work um, efficiently in order to generate income and other resources and other assets. So uh, again, uh, when looking at this uh, diagram, um, the two circles and the, and the livelihood assets and the livelihood outcomes that we have on the, on the left and right of the image really show um, the process and what we're aiming for here. So at the, at the beginning, um, we have our assets um, and a woman can map herself against those assets, again, looking at what does she bring and then through um, your strategic interventions and your practical in interventions, the goal is that at the end of a program, she's able to build, um, build her assets and um, move, to move towards um, uh, a sustainable livelihood. So I'm going to get into the um, more, specific on, more specifics on the asset development piece in the next slide. So the classification of assets um, in terms of the sustainable livelihoods model is done um, in five categories. And I really like the model because um, it can be adapted. And so we, like I mentioned, we have adapted this. This is not how the University of Sussex um, uh, categorize their um, work when they were doing it uh, for poverty alleviation on an international level. Um, we, we, we took the model, but we, uh, through our grant making at the time, um, adapted it to um, women in the Canadian context. And um, the model is continuously being adapted. So the foundation has funded other groups, um, uh, for example, um, Inuit organizations, First Nations, Métis uh, organizations to adapt this um, for, for their context. So, um, uh, so to better reflect their language, their understanding of social and economic asset development. Um, so it's really, uh, uh, it's, it's nice to be able to have that flexibility so that it can be used in different uh, communities and in different contexts. Um, so, uh, even this list right now, um, uh, when we've used it in the past, we always bring our grantees together and test this list in terms of what are they currently seeing in terms of um, the participants that they're working with. Um, and we do, we do offer them uh, and ourselves uh, the opportunity to modify these definitions as needed. Um, so this... Uh, uh, these definitions, again, stem from some earlier work that we've done uh, um, and uh, outline uh, the, the asset areas that we, in the past, have um, used as indicators in terms of um, how women are building their assets, building their support systems, again, and moving, moving, uh, building them to move towards a longer um, uh, sustainability. What we've learned in terms of asset development is that uh, for women, personal assets are often the first to increase when, a w when women participate in economic development programs, and that uh, by building their identity, their self-esteem and motivation, that uh, these are the uh, key assets needed to leverage and build on other assets. So um, traditionally, it's gone from building um, personal assets to building then human assets, which is, again, a lot of the work that you do. So the human assets look at things like employability, education and skill development, um, communication skills, um, and again, um, the, the goal setting pieces. So um, I think this is where a, a, a lot of your work is focused. Um, so naturally, women at the end of the programs, when they're looking at, well, what did they learn and how did they benefit? It's really um, 
uh, following personal assets, uh, human assets um, is uh, often comes next. And then uh, social assets uh, in terms of building a support network, and that could be a support network from um, the organizations that they're receiving the program from through through their peers and through their um, program managers or trainers um, increases often. Um, uh, oftentimes we see family support increase um, and then this trickles into um, increased leadership skills and um, increased uh, uh, civic action often um, as women again um, start to build their assets. Uh, financial assets again um, uh, are, are quite important and really um, the reason why women uh, uh, start these programs and, and uh, their ultimate goal is often increased um, income, uh, being able to reduce debt, being able to save, being able to uh, contribute to their family uh, uh, income as well as um, uh, greater participation uh, in the economy. Uh, in terms of physical assets, uh, we find that uh, for the programs that we're funding, uh, women are starting these programs with many of these assets in place. However, there's still, there always is, uh, a, that again, that level of, of vulnerability. Um, so we do recognize the fabulous work that organizations do in order to help women, um, again, uh, recover from a setback in case there is a need for transportation or child care or elder care, or again, if um, her safety is compromised. Um, uh, so um, uh, physical assets again are, are, are key to all of this but oftentimes we do see that uh, women, women start programs with again um, many of the basic needs um, in place. Um, uh, however, uh, if uh, a big part of your support is again ensuring that she's able to continue uh, to participate in the program and stay in the program um, by uh, continuing to support uh, some of these um, physical um, asset pieces. So as I mentioned, the model and the, the, vision, the vision or the graphic demonstration of the model has changed over the years. And you'll notice in our uh, current call for proposals, um, this, you, you might have seen uh, this image. So it, it's pretty much the same as the previous one. It's just we've changed our imaging here. And um, uh, we are still using uh, uh, the, the broad titles. Um, what I imagine uh, that we're going to do as we've done in the past is uh, when we look at developing our learning and evaluation framework, uh, we are using the sustainable livelihoods model, um, but we will be checking in with um, our grantees um, to discuss these asset areas and to see what are the key indicators that we should use um, in terms of uh, uh, talking about the impact of the work and talking about the work that you do in terms of supporting um, women and their journey out of poverty. Um, so just in summary in terms of the building of um, the assets, we are looking at uh, supporting uh, organizations that do take a self-directed uh, approach um, and help women with their goal setting and problem solving and decision making. Um, again, uh, we do, there, there are a whole, um, uh, a, a whole booklet uh, uh, and a whole series of uh, sustainable livelihoods tools that go along with this model. So um, in terms of self-assessments, in terms of um, asset mapping, um, we will be supporting organizations um, to use these tools and to really think about how their programs can uh, adapt these tools and work with them um, to, to again help women um, uh, on their journey um, out of poverty as well as to help tell the story and I think a big part of the foundation's work is to um, uh, not only to fund the work but to learn about the work so we are going to be um, uh, uh, developing a framework in collaboration with our grantees uh, and uh, developing those indicators so that so that at the end of our five-year initiative we can um, uh, point to promising practices and lessons learned about um, how women build uh, their asset development.
And so this uh, uh, slide uh, illustrates the stages of livelihood development. Uh, so this is our, our, the latest iteration of uh, of the stages uh, imagery, um, and you'll see if you look on our website, um, slightly different versions of this, um, but pretty much um, the concepts and ideas are um, are the same. So as noted earlier, the noted earlier, the model is is and offers a theory of change about how women move out of poverty. <clears throat> So I think this um, illustration um, best highlights um, uh, how we've categorized and how we view um, a women's transition um, to a sustainable livelihood. So using this illustration, um, what we're hoping that you can do is that you can locate your participants along this livelihood continuum. So in the first stage, um, uh, it's called survival. So this is um, where women uh, don't have um, uh, enough income and enough assets to um, to meet their basic needs. So they may or may not be working. Um, there is this is a very um, reactive stage where they're coping with crisis, and there's very little um, and and they have very little in terms of a, a social um, or, or personal uh, safety net. Um, if you move along this, the second stage called enhancing employability, um, this is where, um, again, there's still um, uh, quite a bit of vulnerability, but women do have enough to meet their basic needs. Um, and again, this can be categorized as um, having, uh, having a support system, again, still vulnerable, uh, being able to um, maintain some st savings, but again, um, uh, maybe not 100% being able to weather all of those shocks and setbacks that um, uh, might uh, impact your life. And then you move on to the stage three. This is um, exploring possibilities. This is um, where women are likely in an economic development uh, program. Um, uh, she might still be uh, income patching jobs or she might be um, uh, dependent upon social assistance to help while she's in the program. Um, but again, she is um, uh, working towards her goals, has an action plan and receiving supports um, uh, from a program. And the last two um, stages, four and five, are talking about consolidating possibilities and um, the last one there is uh, obviously um, obtaining a sustainable livelihood. Um, in terms of the consolidating possibilities piece, um, this, likely, this usually and likely occurs after um, uh, a woman has taken an economic development program. So again, she could have completed a, 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 a pre-apprenticeship program or a bridging program and maybe went back to college um, to continue her um, her education and her training. It could be when a, a business has started and she has made some sales. It could also be uh, when um, a woman has completed a training program and now um, has obtained a good, um, uh, stable and meaningful job. Um, so in terms of uh, a progress towards um, a livelihood, uh, we know, and I mentioned this before, but I'll say it again here because this diagram illustrates this, is that um, a, a woman's journey is not a linear journey. There, it, it's, it doesn't go in a straight line. Um, there are those setbacks. So that uh, swirly line um, represents the um, uh, cyclical nature of uh, a woman's transition out of poverty. Um, we recognize that as they build assets in certain areas, um, uh, sometimes um, uh, there is a, the loss of assets in other areas. Uh, or again, sometimes there is a, um, uh, a shock to the system, something surprise, um, surprising happened, and again, it, it, it might set her back a few steps. Um, uh, uh, those little arrows within the uh, those circles, though, um, are there to emphasize that uh, with uh, with wraparound supports, with supports from uh, your organization and your staff, you're always um, encouraging her, and she's also getting the support to keep on moving. So again, it's about building that resiliency. Um, so the only other 
piece I'll add to this slide is that we do recognize that in the early stages, so again in that survival between stage one and two, the survival and the enhancing employability um, stages, we do recognize uh, the tremendous amount of work that organizations do uh, in terms of building the conditions for participation as well as a women's capacity to participate. And these are really where the wraparound supports um, are so vital and so uh, important. The ability to access childcare supports, transportation, um, if there's a housing issue that all of a sudden comes up or a safety issue, we uh, totally acknowledge um, the amount of time spent on um, helping women to, uh, to to navigate the systems, to um, to get access to their entitlements, um, uh, to all of those things needed, so that again she is able to successful, successfully participate in and 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 stay and complete program. Um, I think uh, when we went through our strategic planning process and our theory of change process, when, uh, a, a big challenge for us was, again, where do we position the foundation and our grant making for this next round within this continuum? And there was lots of discussion around, you know, are we supporting stage one to two? Are we supporting stage two to three? The enhancing employability, exploring, uh, exploring possibilities. During that process, and as, as we do with all of our program areas, we, um, we take the learnings from our past initiatives, we, we speak to key stakeholders, um, many who, who were past grantees and, and some who are not, and we really talked about, well, what's happening now? What are you seeing in terms of the, the vulnerabilities that women face? And again, where do you think the foundation can best um, leverage supports that already exist um, uh, in, in organizations and uh, in the sector as a whole. Um, as you can all understand, we also have to take into account um, our, own, um, uh, our own funding mandates and our own um, accountabilities in terms of um, our individual and uh, corporate funders who, who help us to do um, the work that we do. So after m much consideration, where we've landed in terms of uh, the, this next round of grants and this current call for proposals um, is that we want to fund organizations that are working in uh, in supporting and helping women move from stage two to stage three. So women typically would start in your programs, um, again loosely defined as we have just uh, as outlined in this um, diagram. Uh, as, as starting in the enhancing employ employability um, area, stage two. So again, these are not women who are coping with major crisis. Um, these women um, are, are able to meet their basic needs. They're able for the most part to participate in programs um, and, and they're ready to make those, um, uh, ready to make that commitment um, and um, uh, that uh, to take that next step in terms of their uh, uh, transition towards um, greater social and economic independence. And the idea is that through your um, interventions, um, and again, we are, we're funding women's self-employment training programs, women's um, uh, trades and technology bridging programs and pre-apprenticeship programs and women's social purpose enterprises, that through your programs, um, women are then, um, uh, moving towards and by the end of the program or you know um, 12 to 18 months after can um, uh, uh, can show and demonstrate that they're now in the exploring possibilities phase of the model or even the consolidating possibilities um, so uh, our work is situated between stage two and stage three, but we do recognize um, and are flexible in that there will be uh, uh, outcomes uh, for women um, uh, in the exploring possibilities phase, but also in the consolidating possibilities phases. Um, when we look at um, our target uh, population and uh, the women that uh, we want to support, we uh, 
we totally recognize that, again, no one fits into this perfect box, and this is where we, we rely on your expertise in terms of doing those assessments and doing those intakes to see, again, is this woman at a stage of readiness for this program? Um, uh, uh, you know, how can, if she's not, can we support her so that she can be, um, or does, or does she need maybe additional supports um, before she can um, uh, participate in this program? So obviously we rely on you and your expertise in terms of the intake and readiness piece, um, but when we look at uh, applications and when we're reviewing applications, we are going to be um, uh, looking at um, uh, the, the type of intervention you're offering as well as um, um, how you do uh, your assessments and um, trying to find that, that best match between um, the work that you're doing and the work that we want to um, support. Okay, so I think um, I've highlighted, um, again, on, on a very high level, um, where the foundation uh, has decided to situate itself within the model. Um, this, again, the solutions that, uh, the solutions and impact that we are looking um, to, uh, to create really are, uh, really are around identifying um, strong economic development programs that are women-centered, that provide that, um, provide a holistic support, uh, holistic supports, again, start where a women, where, where, start where the women are at, um, but again, take into consideration um, that stage two and stage three, which is again, um, where we've decided um, uh, we can have the best impact and where we can um, leverage um, uh, our funding. Um, we will be uh, flexible in terms of, well, flexible and mindful that, again, you're, you're the experts. So um, you'll notice in our criteria, uh, you can apply for um, funding directly for the program or you can apply for funding that supports the um, wraparound supports. So as I think a key piece in that is being able to demonstrate um, how your program helps a woman move from stage two to stage three and how our funding will be allocated for you to do that. So we are definitely willing to fill in a gap in your funding that you might have. Um, or again, um, uh, if it's um, if it's more about um, you know funding the self-employment program or funding um, a, a, um, a piece of um, the trades and technology program, um, again we're, we're looking at uh, uh, how best we can help you to deliver um, the programs that uh, um, uh, that you're that you're proposing. So I think at this point, um, I will open it up uh, for any clarifying questions or thoughts or comments. Thanks very much, Chanel, um, for that overview. We do have a couple of questions that have been uh, coming in in the question box, and I would encourage you now that if you do have questions, please do uh, type them into that box as we, as we go. Um, so, Chanel, the first question is related to the assets um, that you described, and the question is, how would you define literacy and language in your asset model? So, which of those like asset categories would literacy and language belong to? Okay, I'm just going to put it um, uh, back to our asset uh, definition. Um, so. In my opinion, they would go under the human assets. Um, so even though it's not listed here, um, uh, when we look at uh, human assets, it is things like um, uh, background in terms of education and skills. Um, and uh, in other versions of this, um, I've also seen, you know, um, what, what would also be included in, under this would be um, uh, it could be concepts related to financial literacy as well, um, even though, again, sometimes under financial assets, depending on how it's defined, you can put it under the financial assets piece. So again, th these definitions are not um, 
steadfast, they're um, uh, flexible, and um, I imagine for the next iteration of our work, we are going to be gaining feedback in terms of what uh, what are the indicators um, that we're going to use. One of the learnings from our last evaluation um, report, and, and even previous reports, is that um, it's so important to um, be really specific about the indicators that we're going to track. And um, this, t then this next time around, we are going to, I think, focus a little bit more on the changes that are expected between stage two and stage three. So we're not, you know, I think it's, we, we understand that, for example, physical assets, our, our grant making um, is, is not geared towards um, huge increases in physical assets. So we're not going to emphasize that as much. I, I imagine we are going to emphasize the human assets piece, personal assets, and um, uh, financial assets and what those indicators are again it's going to be a collaborative approach to figure that out okay that's great um, we have maybe a related question to what you were just saying Chanel um, the this participant is asking could we suggest some additions to and re rearrangements of the internal dynamics of the model and do some uh, changes uh, like to, to create some changes to the model to better fit it with the situation and context of the individual organization Sure, <laughs> and I say that with a, with a smile and in all sincerity because the foundation's um, approach has always been about learning and um, learning, adapting, and really our goal is to tell the story. It, it's to help you tell your stories and and um, the stories of w of women themselves in terms of how they are building their assets. Um, and so uh, we've always been extremely um, open and flexible and really willing to hear what's happening in the field, what's happening on the ground, and again, how can we tell that story? So if it's changing, um, uh, you know, parts of, uh, of this model, um, yet we're totally open. And really, um, uh, that's, that's what we've been doing all along. So it has changed, and again, um, if you look at some of our previous reports, um, you can you can actually uh, see how our image has changed, how our terminology has changed. So yes, um, I think uh, we do we do want uh, we do want to hear um, uh, your input, your feedback. And again, we we develop our learning and evaluation strategy in collaboration with our grantees, which I think um, uh, uh, is key and really important to making um, uh, our learning and evaluation um, much more relevant. Okay, um, a third question that we have here um, is related to the granting itself. Um, is there a possibility to partner with an existing program that may cover one stage of the evolution and that that progress, I guess, could be leveraged for another stage? That's a good question. I, um... What I would suggest is, uh, I, I'm afraid to answer that question right now because I, I don't know what the program is about, so I'm not sure if I have enough information. However, um, I would suggest um, you connecting with the foundation um, uh, afterwards to give us the specifics of the partnership. Um, so we, we are open to partnerships, I can tell you that much, um, but I think I would just need a little bit more information before answering um, yes, no, or you know, providing feedback. Okay, great. And um, another question is: um, Have you um, thought about this framework um, and how it, how it would work best in a rural context? So, from the foundation's perspective, we haven't done um, a specific. Um, uh, a specific look at the difference between uh, a rural and urban context within um, uh, within our work. However, I do know that um, Economos continues to use this model and has done um, specific projects uh, in um, rural environments. So, um, uh, if the uh, depending on again our 
portfolio of grantees that we end up um, selecting. If there is a need to change that to better reflect um, the rural context, we're definitely open to doing that. And like I said, I think um, so much has been done over the last um, almost 20 years on this model that um, uh, I don't think, uh, I think some of it already exists just because of the work that uh, um, Economos continues to do. Um, so we would again, um, uh, if needed and if warranted, we would be able to adapt it um, as well. Okay, and uh, we have a practical question from Emily who is asking if you could um, think of a, an example of an organization that has used this framework uh, to create a successful program. Wow, yeah, there, um, there's been a lot of organizations that have done really amazing things with this um, model, uh, uh, including um, um, using it in their program design as well as in their overall um, organizational context. So some organizations have actually um, looked at their organizational um, capacity from a sustainable livelihoods approach. Um, but going back to your question, um, used it in program design. I would suggest, um, or uh, yeah, I would suggest visiting um, the website um, of Momentum in Calgary as an example. Um, I'm suggesting them because I know that they have um, a lot of resources um, online where you can actually see how um, they've used the model and you can see how they have used it to talk, to tell their story and to document their results. Um, so um, that's one organization. Um, I would also look at the foundation's website and um, look at our past grantees. Again, many of them have um, uh, used the model um, uh, in terms of program design. Uh, and so I would also um, uh, take a look at their websites to see um, uh, either uh, descriptions of their programs or again, they, are, they might also have um, uh, specific resources related to um, uh, sustainable livelihoods. The other thing I'll point out here is that the foundation will be um, providing um, more in-depth training on the model um, to grantees um, uh, uh, who will be working with us and who we're going to be supporting over the next five years. So again, if you're not familiar with the model, um, uh, uh, we do uh, build your capacity to learn about the model and we help in terms of um, uh, providing you with the resources and tools um, uh, to actually use the model. Uh, we totally recognize that uh, your um, that as uh, that part of our learning and evaluation is using this, so we uh, do provide you with the um, tools and the mentoring and training so that you can use it effectively and adapt it to your own programs. Great, and we, we have a question here from Jody, and I'm actually going to rephrase the question a little bit. So Jody, if I'm not capturing your meaning correctly, please do type back into the, the question box and let me know. Um, but basically, Chanel, Jody is asking, um, I think about the rationale of choosing um, stage two to stage three as our focus uh, for this grant cycle. And she'd like to know um, whether or not with, like in another grant cycle, would we uh, maybe focus on a different stage like how do we um, decide which um, which stage change we're looking mm -hmm. to support great question um, yes so for when we went through our strategic planning process uh, I would say you know a maybe more than half of the our, our discussions um, throughout that period was just on this you know where do we want to have our, our our biggest impact and so what we did we we actually started with um, what is that impact and what is our, our ultimate goal and we identified that from the foundation's perspective our goal is to have the biggest impact in terms of supporting women towards a sustainable livelihood um, as we can so how can we support the most women in their transition out of out of poverty and and uh, and what? And we looked at where are the key leverage points uh, to do that. And so when we looked at those two things, wanting to support as many women as we can, 
and one and and figuring out well what are the key leverage points and you know it's kind of like when you when you take a step and another step well what are those what are the big steps that actually propel you to the to the next step and that's where we landed and when when we looked at this model and 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 based on our past uh, grant making and our past learning and evaluation strategies, um, everything pointed towards moving from stage two to stage three and this having um, uh, a strong impact in terms of um, helping women build those um, personal assets, those human assets first and then with those two in mind um, comes the financial assets and, and, and the other assets. So that's where we've landed for for our um, goal of 10 grants nationally over five years. Um, who, funding permitted, we um, would love to do and have plans to do additional grant making. So we might be able to do annual grants or we might be able to do two-year two grants, which again might, um, uh, uh, might uh, change again the, um, our point of interaction in terms of this model. So, it, so those grants again will likely be very flexible and maybe we'll focus on um, stage three to four or likewise it might be more of the uh, wraparound supports from going from stage one to two, survival to enhancing employability. So all I can say right now is stay tuned and keep in touch with us as other opportunities in, in terms of economic development um, open up. Um, uh, uh, we will definitely um, let you know and yes, there is the possibility that we can um, slightly um, uh, work in other areas of the continuum. Chanel, um, Jody just clarified as well oh. her question and um, she was also just trying to get a sense of how often our, our priorities are revisited um, with respect to determining where we'll, we'll concentrate on that continuum. Right, so uh, because we fund in um, multi-year and it's five years, pretty much after every five-year initiative we do um, a, a fairly large and comprehensive program review and strategic plan. So uh, uh, so I would say it's every five years, however, we, we monitor and evaluate during those five years as well. And so as I was mentioning, if there is another call for proposals for developmental funding or for another specific type of funding, we would revisit this and we would we would see, you know, our, um, uh, what makes sense given what we want to fund and the impact that we want to have. Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you very much, Chanel. We are now um, at the top of the hour, so we'll have to um, call it a close there. But if anyone uh, online has other questions or um, follow-ups, uh, please don't hesitate to to email me. Um, you can see my name, Karen Campbell, uh, on the screen uh, with my email address. And if there are questions specific for Chanel, I'll make sure that she gets them as well. Um, but thank you very, very much, Chanel, for um, walking us through the framework and uh, for helping us to understand how it relates. Um, and we're getting a, a few thank you notes uh, written in the question box to you as well. So thank you very much for, for taking the time today. And and uh, we look forward to uh, being in touch with the rest of you as you uh, prepare your, your proposals uh, for this grant cycle. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.